Let's pay a visit to Mark's True Crime Corner. This is not a good neighborhood. I'm scared. Now, here's your host, Mark Thompson. The real queen of true crime is here. My other half, Courtney, everybody. Hi. Yep. Hello. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Courtney, I'll turn it over to you. What do you have for us today? Well, I... I was working on another story, and then I had a, a TikTok served to me, mm -hmm. and this woman was talking about the best documentary she'd ever seen in her life, and she fashioned herself a true crime like fan, aficionado. aficionado. Yeah, uh -huh. so I thought, well, I have to watch this. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was getting into six hours of programming um but it it's a it, it's an incredible story and it is told over 11 years of shooting what's the name of the story Courtney? the story is called relentless mm -hmm. and the story follow well the the limited the limited series is called relentless and the story follows a woman named christina whitaker who goes missing um the filmmaker's name is christina fontana and she starts to make a documentary in 2010, helping families with missing family members. And at a meeting um, where she begins to shoot this, what she thinks is gonna be a documentary about these families, she meets the Youngs. And the Youngs are the parents of Christina Whitaker and she learns about the Christina Whitaker story. She goes on to shoot for 11 years, 11 years, She's still working on it, which would make it 14 years. This documentary has been going on all this time. 11 years. And so the documentary came out in 2021. Uh, it's produced by Blumhouse. And most people know Blumhouse as for having a reputation of horror and true crime. Yeah. Um, you can watch it on uh, Max. It was initially on Discovery. If you go down, it follows the story of both sort of Christina and Christina. So Christina Fontana is a filmmaker. And Christina Whitaker is a woman who goes missing. But it's really important because it's not just about Christina Whitaker going missing. It is about organized crime. It is about prostitution and sex trafficking. It is about major drug rings. It is about police cover-up. It is about pedophilia and incest. It is such a layered story that in fact, the only way that I could break it down and tell you about this story was to literally go through every sort of narrative within the six hour miniseries to be able to talk about wow, I don't know if people that contributed to that story. Put so the, the next quote hour again. and a half. Put it, yeah, exactly. I don't know if you have to boil that down to like nine <laughs> minutes. Um, put up the quote. This isn't just a story about a girl gone missing, said the filmmaker. It's a story about a town filled with lies and corruption and violence. Yeah, it is like Karen Reed police cover up, but uh, I'll use Chris's language 10 times that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> A little callback there. Yeah. Um, if you go to the next slide, what's really, what's, what's important for context is to know that this all takes place in Hannibal, Missouri, which is the childhood home of Mark Twain. So, so within every single shot of the town or the city, is Mark Twain, the Mark Twain Hotel and the Mark Twain Childhood Home and Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. It's all there as sort of part of the narrative of telling around this story, but specifically this town. And the town has, I think the population is like 17,000. So it is very small. But imagine within that 17,000 person population is this extraordinary amount of lying, concealing, misrepresentation, murder, drugs. It is on a level that you just would never expect going into watching this. So if you go down, Christina Whitaker was 21 when she went missing. Um, she lives with her mother and her stepfather, and then she has two older brothers. If you go down, if you're watching, you can see the visuals. She uh, had a daughter named Alexandra, and Alexandria was born six months before Christina goes missing. And she names Alexandra, Alexandria after her stepfather. His name is Alex. I don't know where her father is. I think he's, he's left the family. Um, but she is the mother when she goes missing in, if you go down, November of 2009. So she goes out to the bars with her friends. 
Her mother tries to tell her to stay home and encourages her not to go out, but she wants to go out with some friends. So if you go down, she goes out to a bar in town. It's um, it's Rookie Sports Bar. Um, so she goes out to Rookie Sports Bar. She goes to another place, Billiards. She's getting kicked out of these bars. She's belligerent. She's with her friend named Breezy. Um, there's a couple eyewitnesses reports of what she's doing in these bars, but what we know is she's probably taking drugs and very belligerent, and so she gets kicked out of all of them. Um, she does call her boyfriend at 1045 at night. She talks to him about the evening and about their child, does not have any reference about coming home. And then at 7 a.m., her boyfriend, his name is Travis, calls her parents and says, Christina did not come home last night. And so they start to look for her and report her as a missing person. Um, now, if you go up. Mm -hmm. We're seeing Travis. He made the call to her folks. Yeah, he made the call to her folks. Okay. So if you go up um, to the map, the person, uh, a man finds her phone, that little red dot there at the bottom left. A man finds her phone at 7 a.m. where that dot is. If you go down, his name is Danny Baker. He's one of the narrative suspects in this. So his ex-girlfriend says confidently that Danny was with Christina that night, that they went back to Danny's house, they took a bunch of drugs, that Danny and another man hit Christina with their car, killed her, and then dumped her in the river. This woman is telling uh, an account of this as being Danny's ex-girlfriend. Danny is also a sex offender, registered sex offender, who did some horrible things with, with minors. So he is not a good guy. And he finds a phone at 7 a.m. Now he discovers who Christina is because he looks through her phone and knows her aunt. So he takes the phone to her aunt. Her aunt gives the phone to her boyfriend. Her boyfriend gives the phone to her mother and her stepfather. And then the police want the phone. So then the phone eventually gets to the police. So what I'm saying is the only piece of physical evidence from Christina of that night goes through a lot of hands before it actually ends up with the police. Yeah. If you go down, the next woman is named Breezy Carver. This is a woman who Christina was out with that night. She has never spoken to anyone ever about this case. She never responded to the filmmaker and the producers. I don't think that, I'm not sure if she's had a police um, interview. Well, they must have talked to her, I know. the cops, right? And I noticed something last night when I was looking up content around this. She posted a year ago this, and I thought it was very strange to not talk to anyone, not contribute at all, but be on social talking about the case. Very weird. What does it say? I can't see it. It says something crazy. Christina been on my mind, um, been on my mind a lot recently. So she's certainly engaging and watching the story, but she did not contribute at all to this um, limited series. And um, I think she was not really talking to officials. S crazy Christina been on my mind a lot recently. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you go to the next one, then her boyfriend is accused of um, kidnapping her by the parents. They go on this TV show, they talk about it, that's quickly debunked. That's Travis Blackwell. That's Travis Blackwell. He's not the father of the child, but he, as I know it, but he is taking care of the child on the night that Christina's out with her friends. If you go down, another narrative around this is Darcy Morris. Um, that is his cousin, Anthony. Anthony says that Darcy Morris wrote him a letter about killing Christina, about taking Christina from the bars that night um, putting her into sex trafficking as a prostitute and taking her to Peora, Illinois, where he leaves her, drops her off, and that she he got into Darcy got into a fight with Christina in Peoria and killed her. Um, wow. So that is another so story. So who made who made that accusation? Anthony, his cousin, okay. Anthony McPike. The other guy in the left. So that's another. Okay. Right confidence story told with evidence claim that okay. that happened so these stories are believable. <laughs> these stories okay. are believable if you go down the next narrative story about what happened this is a man named glenn ledbetter um he was part of an organized crime family that has been in this part of missouri dating back to like the late 18th century early 19th century in fact 
Mark Twain talks about the criminal family that he's part of in 1870 wow. as being there in 1870. Now, it's a long history of criminal yeah, activity in that area. There's some titling around this family. Um, they call themselves the asphalt crime family or asphalters. They do a lot of fraudulent work with homeowners, um, and that's how they became known as sort of the asphalters because of um, yeah, how they're deceiving people. But he Joe owns Box a, and Little Anthony. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, <laughs> he owns maybe a they big were in the crime property. family. Joe Box and Little Anthony. He owns a big property, and it's alleged that um, Christina is killed by the organized crime family, and she's buried here. Now, on the left hand side is an earlier shot of um, Glenn Ledbetter's property, and you can see sort of on the right hand side, there's like disturbed dirt. And right. then on the right hand side is a very new picture of the of the um, property and there is no disturbed dirt. So um, it is alleged that the organized crime connection is through Glenn Ledbetter. Also, but that her body was found on that property. Never found. No. So no. they're just saying that it was they're buried just saying, there. But what I'm trying to say is there's a legitimate witness that witnessed her being killed by this organized crime. Well, legitimate because the story is believable. Because the story is believable. Okay. Joe but Fish, this Sal is the Shoemaker, like Joe Box, and Little Anthony. <laughs> yeah. oh. This is five or six stories that are plausible sure. that could have been represented as being truthful and you're saying yeah and you're saying the they, filmmaker and they're like, represented how do you make sense a of credible this? way yeah, yeah in a credible way that's probably a better way of saying it and then if you go down um i have a photograph of uh the families from like the early um 20th century 1910 ish that was what family is that this is the organized Joe crime Box family and little anthony yeah, yeah, yeah okay. exactly uh, yeah okay. they're living Fish, in missouri Sal the shoemaker yeah. Yeah. joe Box and little anthony yeah, if you are. go down then little um, anthony really was little back then yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right if you go down then um this is her parents so this is christina with her parents this is cindy and alex young so that's that's when she was just a little girl when she was just a little girl now on the left and then on the right on the right is is um christina and her mother okay so now her mother alleges that Christina had never touched drugs. Christina never drank alcohol. Christina never had any problems. And we just know that not that's not oh, the case. Oh, it comes, yeah. And her mother says that she she wouldn't even know a drug if it was sitting on her table. Uh, there's videos with her with a crack pipe. There's videos of wow. her husband doing drugs. Um, wow. There what? comes out yeah. in um, some of the probation documents from Christina. She was arrested multiple times um, for selling drugs and buying drugs. And um, it is alleged, um, as horrific as this is, that Alex sexually abused Christina when she was a young girl. No. Also, it is known that um, Christina's grandfather, Cindy's father, sexually abused her when she was a little girl. Jeez, the story I know, is full really, of things that really will demonetize awful. me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and then shadow the producer Calvin Wong asks, verify alibis. Where were you on the night of the... What, 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 what about that? I mean, with so many different stories, but are they verifiable from the standpoint of alibis? Um, yes. So, well... Uh, Darcy, to, yeah, Dar yeah, Darcy, uh, his wife says that he was definitely with her and not there. Now, maybe she's covering for him. Um, you know, um, Danny Booker uh, says that he was with his girlfriend, but now his girlfriend is giving that story about being with Christina. So, um, and Glenn Ledbetter, um, there is somebody that says that the organized crime family was involved, but there was no reporting from the police as it relates to um, how far they investigated that storyline, that mm. that suggested um, situation or scenario. Okay, sorry, um, back to the story. Okay. And then the last two, so it comes out toward the end of this limited series that, in fact, Christina was not only arrested by the police multiple times, but she was a um, confidential informant for them. So she was a CI. And now it's alleged that she was working undercover for the Hannibal Police Department on the night that she went missing. Christina was. Christina was. And it was found out that she was a confidential informant for the police. She was set up. And the people that she was set up with, it was just a setup that went wrong. Um, and she was killed, and then ultimately her body discarded of. Now, the police has never in any 
um, in any way really contributed to the story with the filmmaker. They ignored her for about 10 years. I mean, they truly covered this up. It's also known that police officers were having sexual relationships with Christina, doing drugs with Christina, and there was a massive cover-up because they are working very closely with the organized criminal family that I was talking about earlier with Glenn Ledbetter the and the are, drug rings. The yep. cops are working with the criminal yep. family. Wow, it's this crazy. is insane. And then the last part of this yeah, is that is, yeah. one of the people who was working very close on the film with the filmmaker, Christina Fontana, his name was Darren. And Darren, at the very end of this, commits suicide. And it's shocking because he has been a trusted ally in a sea of misleading stories, misinformation, false, false confessions around the missing, um, sort of the, the, what happened to this young woman, Christina. And so Darren is sort of this supportive voice and ally for Christina Fontana, who's the filmmaker. He had worked at the, Mil uh, the Missouri State Sheriff. He had worked at the sheriff's office. And so he had a lot of knowledge about what was happening in the police department. And so and he was talking office. to the filmmaker and it's maybe suggested that he didn't commit suicide, that it was just... Well, that's what I Made thought. Made it look like a suicide? No? No. He is caught with child pornography, and he is caught as being a corrupt police officer. So everything he was telling the filmmaker for years was all a lie. And now oh, it's alleged wow. that he's working closely with the filmmaker to gain knowledge and understanding of how close she was to unlocking this case and solving wow. this case. Max it is the cat says an it. This absolute story is so unbelievably crazy, insane. wild story. I will say the first three episodes are really foundational building and the last three will absolutely blow your mind it really is an extraordinary story and i obviously i hope that they find christina and i you know christina fontana her commitment to this for 14 years is extraordinary that is amazing and documentary yeah. film there's no money in it anyway typically and so this yeah. is an extraordinary thing to tell the story relentless it's called and even the guy so glenn ledbetter who owns the property that allegedly one is where the one confession buried. where the body is yeah. buried somebody bought that property because he died in 2022 and they were trying to extort the film crew, not letting them on the property without paying them. Meaning everybody's in it for themselves. Everybody's yeah. lying. Everybody's misleading. Michael it says, really is, is it crazy. true the new landowners won't let anyone search on the land? Yeah, that was right. just saying that. Yeah. Wow, very good, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it is a fascinating story. And I, I do very much hope that they find Christina. Some people are saying that she's living in Peoria, well, that she's not dead, that yeah. she's a pro she's living as a living sex in Peoria worker w without her phone. But yeah. like, I would also suggest, I don't know that she would just leave her daughter, especially to be in a household that was filled with drugs and with a man who was sexually um, abusing her. I, I just that doesn't to me that doesn't ring true. So, <sighs> unfortunately, I, I imagine that she has um, she was murdered. This Kim. place sounds like a seedy underbelly. Like, <laughs> yeah, ew. It really does What's going on it, in this town? It's sort of why I gave the context of the Mark Twain and just how small it was. Um, because at some point in the life of Hannibal, Missouri, it was like America's hometown. I mean, it's very small to have such crazy networks of things happening. And, and at no point in the story do I really know what anybody does besides drugs and other horrible yeah. things. Wow. It's not really articulated anywhere. So, But I'm sure there are wonderful people that live in Hannibal, and this is a, a, a minority of the population that is in yeah, fact doing but this. Yeah, man, this yeah. is a, quite a story that spans decades, you know. Mm -hmm. um, really something. Wow. Yeah. Courtney. Well, any, any other questions? Let me just quickly uh, see mm -hmm. if um, it was really this woman on TikTok that talked about this. Not a lot of people are talking about this. It's Calvin Wong, who is the shadow producer of this program. Where's the attorney general or local district attorney in this or other managing authority? I know they are. They Not haven't really done anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, at some point, the FBI has been called in um, and they did some work on Glenn Ledbetter's land. But for whatever reason, not a lot of resources have been put toward this, I don't think. 
Uh, Natalie says, if the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, this family has an orchard. <laughs> it is true. It doesn't seem it's like true. the um, kind of family you want to go over to spend Thanksgiving with. Well, it's weird, too. I mean, here's Cindy's, like, building this this veneer and narrative around a family that's really close and has no problems. And suddenly, like, the most horrific thing, things come out. I just, like, I don't know at what point she thought that that wouldn't come to light. I mean, there's multiple private investigators working on this, and there's so many people that have some kind of um, story around what happened that evening. And yeah. it's nothing, none of it is connected to stranger crime, right? It's all connected to nefarious and horrible activity. Well, it's weird too, that they all speak with such credibility. You know what I mean? Like you listen yeah. to stories and go, oh, that guy yeah. really does know. But then as it turns out, there are holes poked in the story. And it, yeah. Uh, and it, I'm, yeah, sounds like police are on the take at minimum, Gordon. I mean, they have conflict of interest, I think, because of all the stuff that they're up to. Uh, well done, Courtney. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. That uh, is True Crime Corner for today. True Crime Corner, only on the Mark Thompson Show. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.